we, we toured in Italy in 1992, uh, well, I guess. And uh, the thing about Italy is that they treat coffee like it's alcohol. And so instead of like you finding big pots of it everywhere, you've got to like go up to a bar and deal with some dude and get this tiny little thimble full of coffee, which is like not nearly enough in the morning. And uh, so by the time we actually uh, left Italy and got into Germany, I was like, oh, finally, civilization. But uh, on the way into Italy, we had, uh, we had a typical border kind of a situation where... You know, a couple of the guys, they didn't really, you know, they'd been through a couple of couple of borders. It wasn't that big of a deal. So they thought, oh, well, you know, let's just take our little chunks of hash, and if uh, we get in any trouble, we'll just eat it. <laughs> well, they, uh, of course, certain countries are a little more savvy to rock stars than, than others to rock bands. So they met us at the, uh, at the border. They immediately sick the dogs on us. And the dogs went directly to the guys with pot. A, the, the cops grabbed both hands, and before the guys got a chance to get the, the hash into their mouth, it was in the hands of the law enforcement officers. So we sat there for a while, and they went through everything we had, and they took all the cash that we had available from t-shirt sales. They uh, propositioned our women, suggested that maybe uh, sex with our women and all of our cash could get us uh, out, of tr out of a jam. Um, the women didn't go for that, and so we sat there for a while longer. Typical. Uh huh. And um, and so actually, the one of the, the main guys gets called in. He comes in. He makes a phone call. We wait around for a while longer. And his daughters show up, and he starts speaking to them in Italian. And I can't tell if he's saying, um, "Is this a band you like? Shall I let him go?" Or is he saying, "See what happens to you if you use drugs. You'll end up like these losers." Anyway, after about three hours at the border, we like they take all of our cash, so we leave and all of the hash. So we make it to the gig. And we're all pissed off because, you know, it's now way past sound check. And we get there and we're all like, oh, we got hung up at the border. And the promoter is like, wow, you guys got here quick. Usually they hang up bands for like six or seven hours. Turns out that if they find something, they run you through the ringer and then you just, they let you go. But if they don't find anything, they take your car apart and all your gear apart and you're there for twice as long. So it was actually better that we, that we found, that they found the hash course, you know, they took like $2,000 for a t-shirt sales. The Knitting Factory shows were actually like the first unplugged shows we ever did. So uh, you can see uh, there's a certain level of kind of tension and out of control energy. Um, I'm playing too loud and uh, you can actually see Chris turning to me at one point going, mellow out, monster mellow out. And I'm going to look, look up at him like, a, huh, where am I? Who am I? Mellow where? How do I stop? I can't get off this thing. But um, it was a fun show to do, even though, uh, you know, and later on we started doing a lot more, um, you know, acoustic shows. And I switched to, uh, instead of drumsticks, I switched to these little balsa wood spoons that I found in, uh, in like, a, a, a kitchen store somewhere, which were quieter after, like, trying all different utensils and all different types of drumsticks. These little uh, spoons worked best for me. Um... Another thing about the uh, knitting factory shows was that it was the 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 night after the first World Trade Center attacks. Uh, Kurt made some mention on the tape of uh, you know can't we all just get along? You know maybe we should all just kill ourselves. And uh, of course we were like uptown or downtown or whatever. I guess we were uptown and we were headed downtown and suddenly we noticed that every vehicle was like racing in the opposite direction from us and all this black smoke started rising up out of downtown so um, and we thought that was pretty cool because uh, we always had been in like like we were in LA for the riots and for the um, and for the, the last earthquake that they had had and we were in England when they had a hurricane and uh, we thought it was pretty cool we always seem to be in town when some problem is happening of course um, Later, one of our roadies got in trouble in an airport for, uh, like, scribbling smoke coming out of a picture of the World Trade Center in one of the, the magazines, and on the, the magazines and the, and the airlines. So we uh, didn't, didn't learn to take things seriously back at that point. Uh, nowadays, I think everybody takes that kind of stuff a little bit more seriously, but it was 10 years ago. 
when we uh, when we when we released uh, Too High to Die, the label came up with this uh, promotional tour we were going to do, and they called it the Munchies Tour because we were going to like basically play for free for people and then give them free food. And these would be like radio people and uh, retail people. So they called the Munchies Tour, took a bunch of our drawings of people smoking pot and, and eating food and stuff and put them on these lunch bags and put little meat puppets, tchotchkes, and key rings and photographs in them. So that's where we started playing uh, acoustically uh, more often. And uh, you know, sometimes we would do in stores and when fans would come and we would like sign their stuff and everything and Chris always loved to like draw these elaborate drawings on people's arms like little fake tattoos or on their pants. Um, so in 1994 when we were touring for uh, Too High to Die we opened for Stone Temple Pilots for about uh, three months which was interesting and we only really knew 45 minutes worth of material because we had brought along a second guitarist so it was good that we were opening because we only knew 45 minutes of material and that's all we played. And we ended up playing pretty much the same thing night after night, which I really liked because it gave us a chance to like really fine tune the show and get it just right and uh, you know, not play anything that didn't work and not do any 25 minute jams on songs we didn't know. And, uh, but Chris especially hated it. He loved the 25 minute jams and he hated playing the same thing every night. Um, <clears throat> The other drawback from opening for Stone Temple Pilots was that um, we'd been around forever. We had this fan base. We had never gotten popular. They were popular. Um, a lot of our fans didn't like them. A lot of the journalists that were doing reviews, interviews with us, would try to get us to say things about uh, Stone Temple Pilots to, and try to get us into trouble with them. Uh, usually I sidestepped that, but one guy was just too intent on hanging me with my own words. So he said something like, so how long have you guys been together? And I was like, you know, 15 years. I said something like, we've been together 15 years. And so he writes in his article, you know, it's such a bunch of crap that these guys have been around forever and then these crummy bands comes in right, right in and just gets a hit right after the way. According to Bostrom, We've been together for 15 years! So he tried to make it sound like I was slamming them. That was the major problem with playing with Stone Devil Pilots. After the tour, um, everybody, uh, they sent everybody involved with the tour a lava lamp that said, uh, Great tour, Stone Devil Pilots 1994.